So the next presentation um, uh, is going to be by Mark Geyer. And what I asked Mark to do, maybe I even foreshadowed a little bit if you listen to my director's report, where when I got to the common fund, I talked about sort of the phasing out of some common fund projects, like molecular libraries that we've been involved in. And then I talked about the birth of new common fund projects that were going to be heavily involved in, like the undiagnosed diseases program, and then a bunch of projects in between those two in terms of their, uh, where they are in their life cycle. Um, needless to say, and, and it relates to discussion we've had uh, with Council uh, um, before about how NHRI's extramural program is heavily involved in helping NIH lead common fund initiatives. Um, and that has uh, lots of advantages, and it has, you know, also the additional responsibilities. I mean, I will, I will state unequivocally, I, without knowing the numbers off the hand, I've looked at these numbers before, we are by far, by far, the institute more involved with the common fund than any other institute. And I think, you know, I don't know where, I don't know what the, I forgot the exact number of how many common fund projects we're co-leading. But it's so like, it's how, it's how many is the mark? Is eight or nine or something or ten? I think it's nine. Nine, nine. And then the next institute that's co is like two. So, I mean, it's like now we stand out completely. Now, that's, we, we think this is good. There's a lot of reasons for that. And I think many of them are obvious. But it is, therefore, though, a, a big component um, of our extramural program and, and, and only continues to be so. It's not fading away by any means. Um, and so I thought it was important uh, to, to give an update at a council meeting where there was time for this so that you can sort of see the big picture about all the different responsibilities we have for the common fund. Um, and so that's what Mark's going to give you and as a bit of a scorecard about where things are, where they're going, but it also I think gives you a complete view of our involvement um, at leadership responsibilities uh, for different common fund initiatives. So <clears throat> just to make sure everybody uh, knows what the NIH Common Fund is. I thought I'd start there. Um, the 2006 NIH Reform Act established the NIH Common Fund as a uh, pot of money um, under the control of the NIH, NIH director for the specific purpose of supporting uh, forward-looking um, projects that had broad application across many of the, the missions of uh, many, if not all, of the NIH institutes, but which no one institute itself was going to uh, take charge of and lead. And there have been several different uh, processes that uh, have, we've gone through since 2006 to identify uh, such, uh, such projects and to uh, uh, get them up and running. But um, at the moment, um, <coughs> there are now 27 uh, of these projects that have been uh, uh, initiated. And they range uh, from very basic, um, let's see, something like epigenomics or uh, nanomedicine, uh, through <coughs> um, very uh, applied uh, patient reported outcomes measurement information system, and so forth. And, and uh, each of these projects is managed on the, on behalf of the NIH by, uh, by the ICs. And for each project, at least two ICs um, are institutes and centers are designated as the co-leads. There may be uh, three or even four on occasion. And then any institute that, uh, that has interest in being involved in the development of the ideas and the management of the program is uh, <coughs> uh, welcome to uh, um, add one or more members to what's called a working group. So each of these uh, projects has a lead or co-lead institutes and then a working group consisting of uh, staff from all of the institutes that have interest. So for the, what, what Eric is saying is that um, <clears throat> for the um, project, these are the projects that NHGRI is, is a co-leader of. 
So of the 27, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9. I was right. <coughs> 9. So a third of the common fund projects uh, have um, NHGRI as, uh, as the co-leader. And in many cases, uh, this is uh, uh, the our institute uh, really takes the, uh, the major um, uh, role, among, even among the, the co-leads. And then <coughs> those are the, uh, um, the programs, the, the uh, common fund programs, that uh, in addition to the ones we're leading, we have staff who are participating in the working groups. And uh, um, <coughs> so we're talking about uh, somewhat over half of the, uh, the common fund projects that uh, NHGRI is involved with in one way or another. And there, there actually are a couple of others, extracellular RNA communication, which is a relatively new one where we probably should have somebody, but don't. And then there are uh, one or two that uh, are being developed now uh, where um, staff is, is actively participating. So that's basically the, the point I wanted to make by this talk. I um, put in, I think, uh, I finished it over the weekend, so I think it's gone into the Electronic Council book. If it uh, hasn't, it will be. It, a t just a table of the, um, a little bit more information about uh, both the programs for which NHGRI is the co-lead, and uh, <coughs> here is the, um, the, the dollar figures that I used earlier in coming up with uh, $200 million. This is the total uh, amount of funding from the Common Fund um, uh, for FY12 in, in each of those programs. Common Fund programs have a, all have a finite lifetime. Uh, they are, uh, originally they were um, up to 10 years and generally made as <clears throat> either um, two or three year pilots before they really got going or um, five year phase, first phase and then a very hard review to uh, determine whether they were still relevant and still important to go for another five years, but it was a 10 year max. Um, the trend more recently, last couple of years is to make it harder for um, for, fun, for common fund programs to actually go for 10 years um, because they're trying to generate, uh, they, they've, they've sort of reached the maximum amount of uh, funds available for common fund programs and now the only way uh, that can get more, get money for new uh, common fund programs is either if the NIH, uh, the total NIH budget increases, then the common fund can, increase in proportion or else by turning over existing programs into new programs. Um, so for H3 Africa, for instance, um, which uh, in, in terms of uh, all the development work we did in planning, everything we heard said you really have to have a long-term commitment to, to this effort uh, to, uh, to, to have a chance for it to then become sustainable. And, um, but we were, we were told that we couldn't even announce it as a potential 10-year program. We had to announce it as a five-year program. And if it goes well, then when we come through review, and if we do well in review, uh, there's a good chance that it will be ex uh, continued for a second five years. But we were not even allowed to mention <coughs> uh, 10 years. Uh, Jill, you look. No, I, I, I just was curious. Um, you know, you talked about sort of these short pilots and then moving into the funding. Right. But I, I assume those pilot years count towards the 10 years, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. Right. So uh, GTEx is an example of a, uh, one of the projects that started as a pilot. It was initially um, uh, started as a two-year pilot with the purpose, the, the goal of simply demonstrating that uh, enough donors, 
could be obtained and that RNA uh, of sufficient quality could be obtained from multiple tissues post-mortem. Um, it actually took um, long, it, uh, it, it took almost the two years to collect the data, so the pilot was extended for a third year to do the analysis. But now that the analysis was done and it was uh, uh, shown to be a very, very feasible and, uh, and informative, uh, it's been renewed for another five years. So, <coughs> um, so, as, so, so as I said, uh, NHGRI is a uh, co-lead for nine of these programs. This is the first four. Uh, and then five, and, and you have this information available to you. And then there are several other programs <coughs> where we participate in the working group in pretty significant uh, ways that, um, <coughs> that are sh also shown in this table. So I think I'm going to stop there rather than going into specifics of any uh, of the individual programs. Eric gave you some highlights this morning in the director's report of about four or five of them, and uh, we will continue to bring, uh, to, to update you regularly on uh, these um, programs, these projects in the director's report, but we wanted to give you an overall picture of uh, how deeply involved NHGRI is in this, uh, in this uh, major effort on the part of NIH. Rick. Um, I think it's great. It's one of the hallmarks of the institute that you reach out way, way, way more than others. Uh, how you end up taking these on? Do they come to you, or do 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 you solicit them? Uh, that's one thing. And the other is uh, when you say by far, I, I didn't actually get the percentages mark, but just seeing that list was remarkable. It's a huge number. Um, you don't have the staff. Uh, sorry, your staff must spend some significant portion of their time on this. It goes back to what we were talking about this morning. Do you have? have yes, yeah, so let me answer them in reverse order. Yeah, well, okay. actually, what? Oh, could you put back up the? If you can, if you could put back up. There was actually a column in there that listed um, the staff commitment we have to each of those projects. Uh, to be fair, we get funds from the common fund to support the staff. So our extramural, if, let's say we didn't have anything to do with the common fund, we would have a smaller staff. I mean, so it's not that these are not, this, while it is put on people's backs because they want to do it in many cases, but the truth of the matter is we have a larger staff because of, if you look at the column, the CF, common fund, FTEs, those are just, and then, and, and, and so forth. So it just, it indicates how many individuals that the common fund is providing resources for in terms of salaries and so forth. So that's, that's over and above what we pay for the normal. Correct. Yeah, so, right. so when we put in, a, when we develop a proposal uh, for the common fund and we develop a budget for that, we include a uh, so-called RMS sector, paying for staff, staff travel, and so forth and so on. However, um, I, I will say that um, this, that doesn't really capture all of NHGRI's costs. Um, uh, things like uh, the actual grants management, um, they don't pay for, we don't completely recover costs. The, uh, the budget office, the administrative costs, we don't, uh, we don't completely recapture our costs. And, and the argument there, of course, is that we do benefit. And maybe this relates then to your first question, Rick, which is like, how do these ideas come through? Everyone's a different story, right? I mean, and, and to be honest with you, the fact that some of these were ideas that Francis had and he incubated when he was in, in this institute when he was a director and then, you know, either either while he was director became in Common Fund or when he became the NIH director became common. These are not all fully independent phenomena. And so some of it's that. Some of it is uh, we have ideas because and, and every single year they go through a different process of nominations of new Common Fund initiatives. Um, and uh, so, and we're often there in the middle of putting things forward. I'll tell you, to be honest with you, the, the la latest edition, undiagnosed, the Undiagnosed Diseases Program, I had no idea that it was going to end up in the Common Fund. It was a, a corporate issue that had to be solved at the NIH level. Um, we worked very hard to, with Francis to figure out what was the best long-term, because it was being done through a very 
sort of short-term funding arrangement that had to be fixed in the next phase. It was clearly a successful program. And so that was the institutes getting together and institute directors getting together and debating different options. And at the end of the day, they said, you know, this just feels like common fund and we develop a larger network and so forth. And so that was the institute directors basically endorsing the, or proposing the idea that it should go into the common fund and then Francis agreed to it. So there's an example, that's not even the solution we were looking for, it just ended up being that solution. I will tell you similarly, you heard about this morning the three reports of the working groups from the advisory committee to the director with uh, uh, data and informatics and big data being one of, but one of three, all three of those are being looked at as possible new common fund projects, big data just being one of them, but even the workforce issues and, um, and, so, and some of the other, and the third working group as well. So they come from different means and then they get debated and then they ultimately get decided and, and the same thing happens even with pilot projects that, you know, some of them they, they fund as pilot and then they, they decide uh, whether to scale them up or not. The, the common fund office in the last uh, three or four years has uh, made an effort to reach out to the community for ideas as well and they've uh, had each year one or two meetings um, either by invitation, mostly by invitation. Uh, um, they started off uh, uh, in inviting a lot of senior people to one meeting and then the next year they went to inviting uh, many junior people um, at, at the start of their career just to talk about areas in which um, common fund uh, projects would be appropriate. And, and I'll, I'll say one last thing. The other reason, of course, why we have responsible for so many of them is purely cultural. And it's the fact that so much of what the common fund does are sort of top-down managed, highly focused, community-oriented projects that guess what? That's, that's our culture. That's what we're good at. And, um, and they turn to us. And, you know, and many of them are not disease-specific. And they're very enabling. And, and that's just what we're good at. But I also think it's uh, a sign of the totally awesome power of genomics. And a lot of genomics and a lot of them. Yeah. Do you have a graph of the budget of the Common Fund over time? I mean, I'm just curious as to whether this kind of enabling infrastructural kind of, uh, the percentage of money that's going to that has increased over time or not. Uh, I don't have it with me. The answer is yes. The, um, uh, the legislation that established the fund uh, started out at uh, maybe 250 million and then increased to 500 million over a few years and then now it's stable le level at 500 million a year. Like all the rest of us, they're cap. I mean, they're sort of flat. That's what they are. But other <laughs> questions or comments? Okay. Great, thank you, Mark. So um, I think we're, we're scheduled for a break now. Seems like a good time for a break. So um, the, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a break, and then when we come back, we're gonna do the one concept clearance we have to discuss. And if we time this just right, then we'll be done with that at four o'clock, which is when um, we will uh, move to the last topic uh, related to the intramural research program. So I'm thinking we should reconvene it and after? Quarter after? Quarter after. Quarter after. Okay. So, and I guess the place upstairs we know is open now for another hour or 55 minutes or something. But we will reconvene then at uh, 3.15. Thank you much.